The Girl Who Lived, a Patreon exclusive series of bi weekly episodes for Aki Politics. We are going to talk about how the series would look like if the genders were reversed. I am joined by my producer, Helene Carp. Hello, Helene. Hi. I'm so excited. I am too. Do you remember how we got into like this discussion about, oh my God, this should be a series? <laughs> I'm, I'm like trying to think about what prompted the conversation, but I remember one of us was just like, oh man, I was always interested to know like how the series would be different if Harry was a girl. And I can't remember how that was prompted. But... I think so. This is what happened, I think. So we, uh, you and I were messaging about topics for Occupolitics, and I had shared a spreadsheet with you about the politics that we were going to cover for Goblet of Fire. And you were like, oh, I saw that someone is already booked for the politics of the patriarchy. I would really oh, be interested in yes. something like that. And I was like, oh, I just recorded that last night. But yeah. I've always been interested in like, what would it look like if Harry was a girl? And then we just went into this rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, my love for smashing the patriarchy is like a huge part of my life. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do in this series. <laughs> yes. Down with the patriarchy. Smashing the patriarchy that Joanne Kathleen Rowling <laughs> yes. created for these books also. Hey, it's ingrained deep inside of all of us. There, we can't avoid it. We're surrounded by it. Yeah, no, and that's completely true because um, I, the way that I described it in the the one episode that you wanted to be on, if no one had already claimed it, I said, you know, the patriarchy is kind of like the air we breathe, and sometimes I catch myself being patriarchal and upholding the patriarchy. Like, what are some times that you catch yourself doing the same thing right yeah no it's constant I mean we do it so subconsciously at this point it's um it's good to always point it out though and correct it when you can but I mean even the most feminist of writers and you know screenplay or screenwriters you know they they all are, fall subject to it so it's we yeah can't and that's completely true um do you have any instances, speaking of that, do you have any instances of where you've ca caught yourself and been like, oh no, <laughs> the patriarchy oh. has gotten to me? <laughs> I mean, I feel like when um, I find myself, you know, feeling resentful towards a female character in a TV show or even in real life um, for like having romantic interests in someone that I like, you know, and then like, you know, pitting women against each other in that way. Um, yeah. you know, getting mad at the woman for something that is not, that is like the man's fault, basically. Like I found myself, you know, watch, like I watched the bachelorette and the bachelor and I find myself like given into the patriarchy all the time on accident with the, with when I watch that show. It's just, it's like a trap yeah, for, no. for that kind I, of thing. I feel that like, I, I think a, another way that I can give into the patriarchy sometimes is this idea of like romance and like a man, um, like a male love interest will help me solve my problems, you know? Oh my um, God, yes. Which is like the romantic notion of like, you're not whole until you find the one. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. And I absolutely hate that, but I've I've definitely found myself in that trap before too, so. And like, and, and I'm not like dissing love. I'm, I'm very much in love uh, with my husband, uh, course, but he yeah. doesn't complete my life or my life isn't somehow complete because of him my life is complete already he's a bonus yes women do not need men to be fulfilled but it also, is a nice yeah marriage is not an accomplishment yes yes you can be perfectly fulfilled in your life without a husband or a romantic partner i agree yeah it's it's just a bonus and it's nice but it's not a must have um exactly. Yeah, but, but that's kind of like the patriarchy talking, right? Because that's the way that women are kept kind of, like, especially like cis straight women are, are kept at the behest of cis uh, white men. Oh, definitely. Couldn't agree. Um, yeah, okay. I want our listeners to get to know you because this is going to be now, this is going to be out for everyone to enjoy, but from uh, episode two on, it's just going to be for patrons. So let's do uh, get to know each other uh, for the listeners out there. Are you ready? I'm so ready.
Okay. Now we've talked about the patriarchy, but tell me, when was the first time you read the series, our beloved series? Yeah, um, I remember it pretty well. Um, I think I was about eight or so. Um, and so my dad was trying to get me to to read more as a child. Um, and so he's offered this incentive of, um, I will give you a penny a page for every book that you complete. Um, and so it was kind of like I could earn money by reading. Obviously, a penny page isn't a lot. Like a 200-page book would get me like two bucks. But mm-hmm. um, when I was eight, I was like, heck yeah, I want more money. So I picked, <laughs> up, <laughs> I picked up the Harry Potter series. And I was like, this is, I think only like the first like three or four books were out at that time. But I was like, this is like a cash grab, right? If I read this entire series, I'm going to get so much money. <laughs> um and yeah, I just baby feminist in making. I love it. Right, right, exactly. And I just it I just fell in love. I didn't expect to love it half as much as I did. And I was so passionate about it from such a young age that it kind of inspired my dad to read it too. Um and we've kind of bonded over that um, you know, throughout the years in my childhood. He is also a huge Harry Potter fan now, um, probably not as big as me in like but but he's he still loves the series and same with my sister she started reading it and so then we would all go to midnight premieres together and um, book releases and it just kind of became like a family thing Uh, my mom also enjoys it but she I don't know if she's actually read the books um but yeah it's something that we all kind of bonded over I mean I know a podcast is the non-visual medium but like I am smiling so hard right now (laughs) because it's so heartwarming first of all baby feminist getting paid Heck yes, Beautiful. out for the paycheck, out for the paycheck. <laughs> and, and I am a big advocate of people getting paid. Um, <laughs> but, but also that, you know, he, he got into it and it became this family thing that just very heartwarming. Yes, and it's still my dream to get my dad to go, to go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando. I've been multiple times. My best friend from high school actually lives down there and has a season pass. So I go visit him like two or three times a year. Um, but my dad hasn't gone yet. And it's like, I really just want to go and show him Hogwarts and I want to show him Diagon Alley and Hogsmeade and, and just have the experience with him. So I'm, I'm hoping to do that one day. <laughs> I, I could live there, honestly. It's my favorite place. Like people say the Disney is the happiest place on earth. It's definitely, uh, Wizarding World of Harry Potter. I, ah, I could move over Disney. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I can and have spent like two 12 hour days in a row just in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Like we went to Universal and I don't think I rode, I think I rode like one other ride that wasn't Harry Potter, but I literally just spent two 12 hour days in a row just walking around Diagon Alley. And oh, it was just, it was amazing. I, I, I yearn to be there. <laughs> yeah, I went in October of 2017 because my friend was getting married and she lives in Florida and I have cousins in Florida and my, uh, some of my family members actually work at Universal, so I, you know, I get good hookups. Um, but my husband had never been to Universal Studios, or otherwise, I wouldn't have shown to him any other place in the park. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, we we went to to a lot of the rides, but we spent a big chunk of the time like between Islands of Adventure, Universal Studios, and like the Harry Potter parts of the parks. Oh yes, definitely. It's my second home. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so um, I don't know if we talked about this, Elaine, but I used to work at Universal Studios. Oh man, I, I don't know if we have. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, this was pre Harry Potter, obviously. Mm. Um, I'm older than all of y'all. Um, <laughs> I was 18, and it was between uh, high school and college. And my aunt, um, you know, asked me over. She's like, "Hey, do you want to stay with us for the summer? And you could work at Universal." I'm pretty sure like you'd get hired, like the job fair is happening soon. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Cause I wanted to get new clothes um, for starting college. And uh, I spent like most of, like all of my school years were uniform years. So I had very little in ways of like casual clothing for college. And so I was really psyched about that. And I, did the interview rounds and I ended up working at Jurassic Park River Adventure and I only chose it because it had the least horrifying uniforms. <laughs> that that's a valid reason. That's a valid reason. 
<laughs> That's also, so like it's summer and hot and like uh, did you ever go to islands of adventure before harry potter um i might have but the first time i remember going is uh like right after hogsmeade opened diagonally wasn't open at the time i think it was in like 2011 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the first time I remember being there. So what Hogsmeade is used to be mostly like a kind of like um, Arabian Nights type theme or medieval theme also. It oh. was like a mix of like, it was magical, but in a different way. And they used to have this roller coaster called Dueling Dragons, which is what um, oh, one of the yeah. roller coasters is. Yeah, they used uh, to have that. I think it's not there anymore in Harry Potter World, but they did keep that, I think. Yeah. Harry Potter World. And um, they used to have to wear tights oh my and, God. and like long pants and like long sleeve shirts, like very medieval, like looking clothing. And I was like, oh, hell no, <laughs> I am not working there. And th- when they let me pick where I was going, because I guess I did really well on the interview, I was like, um, Jurassic Park, because it has the best costumes. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I, I definitely understand that, that life choice. Yeah, and it was, I think, the best job I've ever had. Oh, that's <laughs> just awesome. Tearing up, just tearing up thinking about it. Oh. I mean, it was like three months. So, of course, I didn't get to like be just upset about that job. Um, and also, I knew it was temporary and like I made a lot of friends. But now I'm thinking back and I'm going like, oh, that was such a fun job because, you know, it's, you know, you were young and you're running around and like I'm an extrovert. So, of course, I love like, dealing with people but yeah um, that was the the last I guess one of the last fun jobs I ever had oh man yeah it sounds it sounds like a blast I have a friend who is a VIP tour at Universal right now and she loves it so I can imagine it's it's a great job oh man that's that's also a sweet gig because you just get to walk around with people like showing them the attractions yeah yeah she she loves it and the Halloween uh, Halloween Horror Nights I think is like her favorite thing to work when she's there so Oh yeah, I've never been though. I think I've been once, but it's it sounds amazing. Hmm. Maybe your next trip should be in October. No, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> your next uh, quarterly trip. <laughs> yes, I think that's the perfect idea. Let's get back on track because I derailed us completely. <laughs> what house are you sorted into? Hogwarts house is Hufflepuff. I'm a true Hufflepuff to the core. Um, I used to think that I was a Ravenclaw and then Pottermore happened. And when I got sorted into Hufflepuff, I was like, oh yeah, no, that makes way more sense. That makes sense sense to me. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. I I, uh, get Hufflepuff on every single like random quiz that I ever take. So true Hufflepuff. I used to think I was Slytherin. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because I was, you know, like people who know me are like, no, (laughs) but you know, I used to think I was Slytherin because I was ambitious, right? And every (laughs) quiz is like, Gryffindor. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I have a friend who uh, thinks he's Slytherin, but I think that he is way more Ravenclaw. So we have that argument all the time. <laughs> Has he been sorted in Pottermore? He's a Hufflepuff, like, so he is a Hufflepuff, but, like, he, like, if his secondary house was, like, if he could choose, he would say yeah. Slytherin, but I, I think he's more of a Ravenclaw. Isn't there a BuzzFeed quiz he can take and it'll tell you what your like percentages are? I think we, I think I made him do it and I think it was pretty, pretty close um, between the two. Uh, ah, I see. I see. But. It's funny how we like can supposedly tell how my, like a lot about a person by like, but what house are you really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. As and a whatever fandom. I- <laughs> Whenever I take those percentage quizzes, it's always like 72% Hufflepuff and then like 10% like everything else. <laughs> you know, that makes a lot of sense, Lean. <laughs> yeah. I put it like 2% Slytherin and then like Gryffindor and Ravenclaw are kind of in the middle. <laughs> I mean, but Hufflepuffs are the best. Oh, I won't disagree with you. I think that they're pretty amazing. <laughs> we got new yeah. Scamander, so I love that guy. Yeah, Newt's commander is my boyfriend, so oh, he's, no big he's... deal. <laughs> and, then, and then for Elver Morning, I'm a Pukwudgie, which uh, I think is also pretty fitting. All right, do you think, okay, so I'm going to be vulnerable with all of you. Do you <laughs> think less of me because I haven't been sorted in Elver Morning? Um, 
I don't think less of you. I don't think less of you. I think that you're missing out. I, I mean, I know that there isn't a lot of information and I really wish there was more information. I like yes. you get like two words that describe like what the houses mean. So like Pukwaji, I know that they favor healers and it's like representative of the heart. Um, so, so I know that that's like fitting just because of those two things, but, but I mean, I think you should do it. I just feel like a fake fan right now. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, I never really did take that. Huh? I meant to, and I forgot. <laughs> I feel like once I feel like when, hopefully in the fantastic Beasts series, we'll like learn more about Ilvermorny. And when we do, I hopefully it'll get more people to be more interested in figuring out what their Ilvermorny house is. Yeah, I feel like we need a little bit more to get into like that, that kind of um, like mysticism about the other schools, right? Like we get a mention here or there, but there's no real connection to that, to that, um, to those houses or to the school itself. Yeah, yeah, I think that hopefully the Fantastic Beasts series will introduce us a bit better to those. I'd like to learn more. Yeah, or, you know, maybe a book series, JK. Um, uh, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, take our money right now. <laughs> Honestly, all the money. I know for me, Harry Potter has impacted how I interact with the world and, and how I think about politics and, and, and things like that. Do you think it's impacted you and, and how, if so? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, the main lesson that I've learned from Harry Potter is acceptance, um, like acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Honestly, like that's like the message that gets just it hits so hard in the series as far as like um, people aren't always what they seem to be and they might look different or they might um, be a different, you know, species or or, you know, Lupin's a werewolf and Hagrid is a half giant and they're both, you know, intimidating from the start. But when you get to know them, like they're extremely great people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, with that message in Harry Potter is, is really relevant to today. I think that um, we don't need to view those who are different from us with like an other perspective. Um, I think that just because we're not the same doesn't make us enemies. I think that our our current political climate could learn a lot from those types of messages that we get in the Potter series is like, um, you know, love your neighbor and and accept them for who they are. And just because they might be different than you or they might be unknown doesn't mean that they're bad. I like that. I really do. Like, uh, to me, uh, Harry Potter is also about you know, be beyond acceptance is about like, which is something I'm I'm going to talk about in the Livios the the Liviosa conference. Um, political organizing starts in like the community, right? So you can't wait for your government to make change. You have to affect change within your community and organize from within. Totally, I can definitely see that message in Harry Potter super strongly. Yeah, because we have like Dumbledore's army, Order of the Phoenix, and then we have like in Fantastic Beasts, like this this uh, person who is not necessarily politically ambitious, but he like cares about magical creatures trying to put a stop to everything that's happening through like instructions from Dumbledore, who can't do anything because his hands yeah. are tied. Yes, definitely. And I think Harry as a character kind of embodies that like, we need to do something about this. Like it's not just going to change on its own. You need to take action. And that is like the definition of Harry. Yeah. Oh, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> he and Ginny are constantly tied for my favorite characters in the series. So Aww, I have lots of about that's them both. Co couple goals. <laughs> yeah, no, it was like a dream come true when they got together in Half-Blood Prince because I loved them both so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, Ron's reaction to them getting together. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Half Blood Prince is my favorite book for a myriad of reasons, but that is definitely one of them. <laughs> oh, that's great. Half Blood Prince. Okay. I think mine is Prisoner of Azkaban, but it's because that's where we get serious. And um, 
I love that fam- that the you know Harry gets a family member for a little while. Yeah, yeah, the Marauders are a great storyline. A lot yes. of people like that. Um, so what's your, do you have like a hot take about the series? Like something that people will, like you will fight people about and you will die on this hill about? Um, nothing like, I mean, there's, I have controversial opinions, but I don't know about <laughs> like, <laughs> about like I would die on the hill about, I mean, I, my, oh gosh, I'm kind of scared to tell you because I know that you don't agree. <laughs> it's totally fine. I, I'm a Gryffindor, but I'm not like inflexible. <laughs> so like my least favorite character in the series is Ron. And oh mm-hmm. God, I'm going to get, I'm going to get so much hate for this. I know this. I no, hate this. I think, um, I think a lot of people agree with you. Not me, but a lot of people. Yeah, I know, I know, I know that you love Ron and I, I definitely have heard you talk about that um, in some <laughs> of your episodes, but um, honestly, like, well, Harry being my favorite character, I think that I'm biased um, when Harry needs Ron the most, he tends to abandon him. Um, and I am really like a fierce friend. I'm really all about like, like if you are my friend, like I am loyal to you, I will be there for you and I will trust you. Um, and Ron, we see it in Goblet of Fire and we see it in Deathly Hallows. Like he, like when it gets tough, he just doesn't, he doesn't stick around. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it makes me so upset because especially in Goblet of Fire, when Harry really, really needs him to believe him and he really needs Ron and he feels so alone and Ron is just being petty about it. And I, and it, and that really, really like. I can't, I can't handle it. And then we get to Deathly Hallows and he abandons him. You know, I know that there's a lot of things going on and I know that, you know, people are going to say like, oh, he did it for this reason and this reason and this reason. And he's a human and he's imperfect and he has flaws and that's why we love him. And I get that. Um, I just don't, I'm, I, I'm not behind those specific flaws. Like you can have, I, I, like I, I can't make excuses for people who abandon their friends. It just makes me so sad for Harry. Well, see, this is your Hufflepuff coming out in perfect <laughs> view, right? Like you yes. you lay the case perfectly. I can understand why you don't like Ron. Like I can t- completely see that. I think for me is that I empathize so much because I was so insecure as a teenager. And like I grew up kind of feeling like I was overlooked in my house and like I had like my family had all these big expectations from me, but like they didn't really pay attention to me other than when I was like messing up, you know, Mm -hmm. like I could do 10 great things and I messed up once. And then, you know, my mom would be down my throat about like how I was messing up and like, um, I wasn't being who I should be or whatnot, but like, I only would get, um, negative attention and that's, you know, a breeding ground for insecurity. So I feel that a little bit for for Ron. Does it make his actions like completely understandable? Not really, but I feel for him. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I think that a lot of the people that are like really diehard Ron fans, like I think they're in the same position. Like they really see themselves in him. They they empathize with him. They they understand where he's coming from. And and I and I like empathize with him on some things. Um, but I think I empathize with Harry more and I don't know if that's because he's one of my favorite characters, but, um, I just, I just wish she would have been there for him. It just makes and me also sad. And also Harry, Harry is meant to be one of our favorite characters, right? He's meant, he is a t- the hero of this series. And you would be surprised though. Like not a lot of people like Harry oh, and it's, that, it's, that breaks it's, my heart yeah. even more than people not liking Ron. Cause I can at least understand not liking Ron. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people just, like, they, they overlook him as far as, like, favorite characters. They always go for someone else. And, and like, you can appreciate Harry, but I, I, I've i seen a lot of um, Harry bashing, and it makes my heart sad. Because that, that kid, I could go on for, for days about about that kid. I love him. Well, we're going to have a, a episode, <laughs> an episode just about Harry, so we're good. 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 <laughs> Well, I I like your controversial opinion, and I feel like we can understand each other, even though we might not agree. See? Exactly. There you go. I love it. 
I, I'm running for senator now. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got my vote. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, do you have any fan theories that you want to share? Um, yeah, I mean, my fa- my current favorite is actually Fantastic Beasts theory. Of course, um, of course. And I, I, my favorite theory is that um, Credence is actually like the personification, like, of how do I say this? He is Ariana's Obscurus um, that has formed itself into it like a human. So I think he is a human form of an Obscurus, and that's why he has been able to survive as long as he has, because most of the most Obscurus um, die, you know, at a young age. But I think yeah. the reason he has survived the way that he the the length that he has, um, and the fact that this whole reveal, spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen Crimes for Grindelwald, the whole reveal of um, him, his name being Aurelius Dumbledore, I think that it's because in some form he is Ariana. I have heard that theory and I love that theory because it's the one that makes the most sense to me uh, with the knowledge that we have thus far. Exactly, yeah. And I think that it's, it's just a very like Joe type of, of plot. You know, it's like a great, a great way to kind of tie it all together. And I, and I really, really cannot wait for the next movie to figure out what's, what's happening. (laughs) Yeah. Like, um, or, you know, like, did it, did it flee Ariana's body after her death? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think happened personally. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else that you want to add about the series? Um, either Harry Potter or Fantastic Beasts before we move on? Um, just that my girl Jenny doesn't get enough, uh, enough love. I mean, I, I would, I would, uh, I, I love her so much. I, I want to be her. Um, and I think that she deserves a lot more love. And I also think that she probably, I think she should have been part of the trio. Make it a quattro. I don't like just like, put Jenny in there because she deserves all the attention. She, I think, uh, book Jenny doesn't get translated well into the movie. No, yeah, and I, it breaks my heart that the movie, the people have only seen the movies, um, just like don't understand when I say that Jenny's my favorite character. They're like, really? I'm like, you have to read the books, please. Go read the books. That's, You'll understand. That's usually my response to anyone who's ever just watched the movies. Just go read the books, guys. It's fine. Yes, yes, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just hanging out with my 13 year old nephew, um, and I hadn't seen him in like four years, so we were, you know, catching up. And he thinks, he thinks, he still thinks I'm cool, which is great. Um, (laughs) And he was, you know, he's bashful, like we were at the Vance store and they had the Harry Potter stuff and Harry Potter merch. And he's like, oh, I like this and I like that. And I was like, so what house are you? And he goes, very bashfully, I've never read or watched the movies. And I was just like, what? (laughs) Oh, man. My child. Why didn't you tell me this before? You've let me go on and on about my podcast about Harry Potter and stuff. And we're at the store and I'm asking you these questions and you don't know what I'm talking about. And so he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, would you like to read the books? Like, I'm like, don't feel uh, pressure to it. And I was like, do you, if I got you the books, would you read them? And he goes, are you just doing this because of the podcast? And I was like, no, I'm doing this because I believe in reading. And also... <laughs> I love you so much. And he's like, yeah, well, I'll read them. And I was like, okay. And I just bought the books on Amazon and got them shipped to his house. Yes. I cannot wait to bring Harry Potter into the lives of of people. That's, that's, that's my, my goal in life. I was just like, um, it's, you know, it's $55, but you know what? This is worth it. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Definitely worth it. Um, and, uh, cause I knew his dad wasn't going to buy him the books and his mom was definitely not going to buy him the books. And his mom actually was the one who bought me the first two books as a Christmas present. So I feel like it's all coming around. Perfect harmony. Perfect it. harmony. And I can't wait to text about Harry Potter with him and his progress. Cause he felt like, he was like, yeah, I kind of feel like, it hasn't come up yet, but I kind of feel like that's going to take me out of a lot of discussions with, you know, friends or, you know, cultural reference wise. And I was like, yes, it will. Yes, it will. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. I'm just trying to like push this on this poor boy. It's necessary. He's my favorite. 
<laughs> Please, no one else tell my other nieces and nephews. <laughs> Let's hope they don't listen to this. <laughs> no, they won't. I mean, uh, I, I don't want them to listen because I curse a lot. So, no. Oh. <laughs> um, so, this segment of Occupolitics that's only for patrons is called The Girl Who Lived. And we just loved the idea of having a female Harry or Harriet, as we will call her. And we started thinking, what would the series look like if all the genders were swapped? Uh, this gave us much to talk about uh, as to the series um, and the series was born. We, we just couldn't stop talking about this, could we? No, yeah, we talked about it for so long. Um, do you want to go on to what we'll be discussing? Yeah, so we'll, we'll be discussing... Um, the implications of the characters in the Potter series um, and how being gender swapped uh, affects their entire story and how they're viewed or treated. So um, in this one, I, we are talking about the Dursleys. Yeah, and um, we're still uh, viewing this through like a patriarchal lens, right? It's not like we're just saying like, now there's a matriarchy in place, right? Like, how would these yeah. characters be perceived if their genders were swapped but also we still had the patriarchy. Yeah, so like, we're basically looking at it as the entire world is exactly the same as it is today, but every single gender in the entire Harry Potter series is reversed. <laughs> like, what if we got a female Harry and everyone else was the opposite gender? Ta-da! You're welcome, people. <laughs> Yes, I think it'll be it'll um make for a really interesting discussion. So today we're talking about the Dursleys, and do you want to roll out the new names that we'll be calling each of the Dursleys? Yes, I would love to do so. So, um, Vernon Dursley, we have Verona. I wanted to call him Veronica at first, and then it, I thought it kind of just uh it, it sullied the good name of Veronica Mars. Um, okay. so <laughs> solid choice, and also Verona feels very like Shakespearean. Yes, I think it's a better fit for Verona. Yes, yes, for sure. Very pompous. Uh huh. Definitely. Um, Petunia. We, I think, the best name for her in um the male gender would be Peter. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And Dudley is now Daphne. I feel like it sounds pretty, like, the same. Like, yes. Dudley, Daphne, you know? Like, that rolls off the tongue the same way. It does. It definitely does. I think it's a perfect fit. So what's interesting about this is that now Verona is, in my mind, kind of like this high-powered, like, business lady. Ooh. Who does like works in like the drills industry and is really worried about what people look like and how she looks and she needs to look good before she leaves the house oh yeah definitely like one of those high powered like in charge bosses yeah maybe with like a blunt bob mm. yep like heels bracing, all the bracing way. her chin heels very slim and trim. Mm -hmm. um, and then Peter is like the supporting house husband. Yeah. Yeah. Stay at home dad. Stay at home dad, making sure the household keeps running, um, baking all kinds of desserts and, and me making meals for like business deals at home. And Daphne is like an overindulgent brat. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah, you have thoughts. Talk, talk to I, me about. That. I yes, I have thoughts about Daphne. I see Daphne as those that one of the, just like a little entitled um, girl who just gets everything she wants. You know, she she um, she is just the spot of her parents' eye. They should they they just give her everything that she could have ever asked for, and mm -hmm. she. Um, she looks down at anybody who isn't as as lucky as she is. Yeah, she's a princess in my view. Yeah, and yes, like definitely. everything would be like violently pink or something like that. Oh yes, yes. She's got the ringlet curls. 
Yes, ringlet ringlet curls, definitely. Um, just the cutest little button, like just cute as a button, little dresses, just everything. But also there's like this idea of like Daphne would also be, because there's this uh, a, a problematic aspect of Rowling's writing, right? Where like she would definitely be like a larger body. Actually, I don't know. I I... I I have some thoughts about this too. I think that if Dudley was a girl, if if Daphne was instead of Dudley, okay. I feel like I feel like uh Verona and Peter would spoil her in different ways because they wouldn't want their perfect little girl to be outside of societal norms and standards for what else. Oh, you know what? I think like. you're right. You you've see you're you're you have turned me to your side. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like they're so they're so obsessed with you know being normal and being perfect that um, it's it's acceptable to have a little boy who has you know some meat on his bones, but a girl like she needs to be society's version of beautiful. So a boy would be allowed to take up space, but a girl would need to be perfect. Exactly. Or take up less space in the physical sense. Maybe her personality would be the thing that takes up the most space. I think that that's very accurate. Yeah, I think that the way that Daphne would be spoiled would just be in material objects. She would be given, um, you know, the the nicest clothes and the nicest gifts. Um, yes. And she- do you think she'd be a horse girl? Oh, she probably would have a couple of horses. Yeah. Like, I sure. feel like <laughs> Daphne is a horse girl. <laughs> and Harriet is like tasked with cleaning up after all the horses and stuff. Very Cinderella. Yes. Yes. And yes, Harriet would definitely have, have the harder chores, which I think he does. Harry does in the series anyway. But, but yes, it would be very reminiscent of, of Cinderella in that aspect. In many aspects, right? Because, like, even the cupboard under the stairs is, like, the least desirable room in the house, just like Cinderella. So, oh, really, yeah. this Harry, Harriet Potter would be a retelling of Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, uh, we're short one stepsister, I, although it wouldn't be a stepsister. But we're, <laughs> we're short one uh, sisterly Uh, presence yeah so (laughs) instead of getting like video games which is what Dudley gets Daphne would get um horses and like luxury items and clothes like you know like something very girly and frilly right yes like jewelry and and all the nicest everything I mean a computer maybe right because it's the, the big aspect of technology in showcasing muggle like weakness or or whatever might Mm -hmm. be part of that but mostly be like luxury items and and nice clothes that she just you know um maybe rips apart doing something and then blames harriet for it yes definitely i could see that for sure okay so cute as a button ringlets beautiful slim spoiled princess um is daphne and then what are your thoughts of like so you, we would have like the uh, Peter and Verona. We would have like a working parent being the mom and a stay-at-home parent being a dad. So like social implications of a male homemaker. What are your thoughts about that? Honestly, I think that having a male homemaker would might might possibly make the Dursleys a little bit more likable. I mean, I know they're horrible. They're more horrible subversive. people. Yeah. Yes, but it would make them seem a bit more progressive, um, which. Right now, in the in like in the normal Harry Potter series, they're very just like you know men make the money and the women stay home and do the jobs that the men don't want to do. Um, <laughs> but if we flip that on its head, then you know it's actually not bad. <laughs> yeah, right. So I was thinking about this, and it brought it to mind uh, several things. One. Um, In the series, Vernon is very concerned about other people's physical appearance, and we don't really um, give it as much of a second thought, I think, as we would if Verona did. Because then we're like, typical women, always thinking about appearance and how people look, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then 
Peter, you know, like Petunia in the series is always like looking to see what the hot goss is in the neighborhood. So if we had like a male character trying to figure out gossip in the neighborhood, we'd be like, what? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it would like he would be the the dad that that take that does all of the mom like go takes uh, Daphne to all of her play dates and, and is the one that shows up at PTA meetings. And he's, he's the one that, that all of the other moms are just like in love with because he's so involved in his kid's life. Oh God. How did like, he just is the best. He doesn't even have to do it and he's doing it. And we would think like, did he give up a career so that he could stay at home with Daphne? You know? Oh yes. Yeah. He would be a beloved by by so many people because he is the sensitive caring dad while as verona would be seen as this am i allowed to, i don't know am I, i'm allowed to curse right of course <laughs> he she, uh, so verona would be seen as this like hard ass bitch who just yes. um just you know asserts her dominance and is very aggressive um but is seen as unapproachable and unlikable because yeah, and she, she's probably like a towering force, you know, like she be like with her like four inch heels, like adding like a, a, a somewhat dominant stance on her workers and her peers. Yeah, she would not be likable at all, while as Peter would be just so likable because he's so sensitive. And also he lost his brother, you know, don't you know? Or but he doesn't, you know, Peter wouldn't really talk about his brother. Um anyway but yeah I don't, I don't know if he would use that as for sympathy points but i don't even know if he would need to yeah mm-hmm. i don't think so um i think a, a peter is much more likable than petunia and verona is just as unlikable if not more than vernon yes yeah i don't think that that the likability of vernon versus verona is is too different yeah so yeah i'm thinking verona like this like severe looking woman with like a almost like um a devil wears prada type a meryl streep character what's her name god i don't remember her i just remember her as meryl streep (laughs) in that movie (laughs) just severe woman who just no nonsense and asserts her dominance and withering stares and put downs yes Definitely. Like, it's not physical dominance in the way maybe Vernon would do it, but it's, like, emotional dominance. Yes, like the I am better than you aura. Or, uh, yeah, or, you know, you're you're just beneath me. Yes, definitely. Um, everybody else is beneath her. I could see that for sure. So, speaking of, like, dominance, we know Dudley in the series is really into physical violence to assert his dominance how do you think Daphne would assert her like dominance yeah I definitely think um physical violence is to in in order to assert dominance is definitely more of a male trait so I don't think that Daphne would you know bully Harry by you know punching him or kicking him around or whatever he whatever Dudley does in the series I think Daphne would take a much more um psychological approach to turn tormenting Harry girls tend to be more vindictive and cruel I feel like when they're when they're younger they tend to bully by making you feel less about yourself um rather than you know physically harming you I think that yeah and I think it's it's more of like this is this is what we've taught we're taught in the patriarchy right that you know women because um sometimes they have less physical strength than cis men uh, or cis boys uh, will resort to more emotional approaches in terms of asserting dominance. So I'm thinking like a a Daphne would bully Harriet by tormenting her about, you know, you're an orphan, you have no one, no one likes you. Uh, no one loves you even. No one loves you. Look at you, you look so ugly in that outfit. Who's going to be want? Who's going to want to be friends with you? You live under the stairs, you know that kind of approach. Yeah. And I think that this um, this entire concept really, like, w- kind of what I talked about earlier about pitting women against women. This mm-hmm. is the patriarchy's way of of instead of having to ru- like ruin women on their own, men have found a way to get women to just do that to each other and tear each other down um, instead of building each other up. So. Um, 
women they found a tend way to, to automate the yeah. system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just they just like do it from the outside. They just watch us burn because we are. They have programmed us in the patriarchy to believe that you know there can only be one woman that's worthy of any sort of love. Um, so if there's another woman there that's that's intimidating to you or um, you know threatens what you want in some way. Like we've been programmed to just attack each other and and tear each other down, and I think that that's definitely what Daphne would do to Harriet in this sense. It would be um, just women being put pit against each other. Oh yeah, so that makes me think about we we have the gender swapped um, Dursleys, and how would they? react to Harriet we've talked about um Daphne a little bit and Harriet but what about Verona and Peter yeah I definitely think if Harry was a girl I mean if Harry was if Harriet was there instead of Harry I think the Dursleys would they have treated her any better that's that's the question I'm not exactly sure if they if their treatment of Harriet would be any different than Harry um I don't I honestly don't think as much because Harry was already doing the chores uh, like a Cinderella type figure. Maybe Harriet would have to do even more than Harry. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like even though Harry doesn't get a lot of um, passes in general. Especially, especially with Peter instead of Petunia in the house. Um, you know how there's that study about how when men think they're doing 50% of housework, they're actually doing much less than what they think they are. I've never heard of that, but that's, that doesn't surprise me. And it is, sounds very interesting. Yeah, no, I'll, 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 I'll link to the show notes on this one and I'll send you the link also. Um, cause I thought, you know, that's a perfect illustration of like when you have, a couple and and both both work outside the home and then you come home and you're trying to divide chores up uh men tend to overestimate how much percentage they're taking taking on in housework this is a generalization but you know we are we are working in the confines of the patriarchy here so um in peter's mind maybe he's doing like 70 percent of the work and he's only letting harriet do 30 percent of the work where it might just be 50 50 and Harriet is just like a 10 year old girl at this point or an 11 year old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I I, I can, I think that, that, um, what do you call it? That link that we made to Harriet being kind of a retelling of Cinderella is, is actually really accurate and telling in this, in this specific scenario of, of when you're, when I think of, you know, how Harriet would have been treated um, as mm-hmm. opposed to Harry, I just all I can imagine are, you know, you know, like Cinderella or like if you've seen the movie A Little Princess. Oh um, yes, I love that movie. With that was directed by Alfonso Cuarón, which you know, oh, I, I love. I him. did not know that. I love that movie, but I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, it just I, like like when she's she's living um, in that boarding school and yes. her dad has died, and she's doing all of the work uh, because her dad is dead and she no longer can pay to go to the school or whatever yeah yeah um and that and that's kind of like what I picture Harriet in in the Dursley's house um is is the one that you know she doesn't contribute any money or um or any emotional happiness to the family so she has to do all of the the work um that they don't want to do because that's how she she pays to be there yeah, and especially thinking about um, physical appearance of uh, Daphne versus Harriet, right? Like, it would be like this English rose, Daphne, mm-hmm. with this, like, dark-haired girl, Harriet. And th- that mm-hmm. would have, like, a further implication in terms of, like, um, physical appearance and, like, in a British context. You know, I, I'm I'm trying to picture her in my mind right now, and... Surprisingly, I kind of am coming up as like a dark haired Hermione in the sense of like she has messy, like not messy, but like large unruly hair. hair. Yes, unruly hair, because that's how hair that's how we know Harry to be. Um, so I'm picturing like this big, unruly, frizzy hair, um, with these, you know, broken glasses and, and yeah. her lightning hair, of course. Uh, yeah, and like so like messy hair, not necessarily maybe frizzy, but like 
so many cowlicks, you know, that it goes mm-hmm. kind of every which way. Mm-hmm. And it takes up a lot of space and not the best way. Whereas Daphne is like this English rose, like aristocratic looking person. And then, then we have like a, maybe like a tomboyish Harriet, you know? Yep. Wearing the baggy clothes that don't yeah. fit her right. Yep. Definitely. Like, like skinny in the worst way. Oh yeah. Like lanky. Yeah. Basically. Well, and I, I'm not saying like in the worst way as I think of it, but as the patriarchy thinks of it, I want to be very oh, yes. clear. <laughs> yes. Yes. We are, we are not body shamers on this podcast. Every, every body type. Everybody is, is a beach body. <laughs> like that is the mantra. Yeah. Yes, a hundred percent. That adds like a different layer than we see in the series because it would add like this tension between beauty standards. Oh, yes, yeah, because we don't see that a lot. Because, well, I mean, the narrator we see the the Potter series through Harry's eyes, and he's this so oblivious, clueless young boy. Um, and he doesn't Even though it's like third person <laughs> omniscient narrator. It's almost like just Harry's mind, really. So. In, in, like, Harriet's mind, it would be, like, a, maybe slight more preoccupation with what she's being told about her physical appearance. Because as as women and living in the patriarchy, right, like, I feel like we kind of absorb those messages a little bit more. Definitely, yeah. I think that the, the entire perspective – and I think we're going to have um, a separate – episode on harry where we we will get into oh, i feel like a lot deep <laughs> yes well we're gonna get into it a lot more but um but in the context of of the the, the dursley household um the, her looks would be something that is highly criticized and especially by daphne and if not both by peter and verona as well like why you're not the societal uh standards of beauty um, so we love you less. Yeah, no, and like Verona will probably like sneer at her and look down on her like every time she comes home, like, oh God, this kid, you know? And like Verona's like, I did not, I'm not gonna give up my career to become a child care like uh person. That's Peter's job right now because he decided to give up his career for this. Um, but also she's like a fairly cold uh parent to Harriet but like a like a chuckling parent to Daphne. And maybe we would think less of Verona because we tend to uh, uphold women to like this higher moral standard. Oh, oh, 100%. Yeah, definitely. And I think, and you know, before, and I feel like this is the patriarchy at work with me, uh, because before I started thinking about the Dursleys and the gender swap, I was thinking, oh, so if, you know, Petunia was a man, i.e. Peter, then people are like, oh, did he give up a career? And then I felt bad because I was like, I never thought, did Petunia give up a career to stay at home? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You're so right. You're so right. I just accepted it. Like, when has anyone ever thought, like, did Petunia go to college or whatever they call it in the UK? I'm sorry, I'm not from the UK. So uni yeah. or whatever they call it. Uni, did did yeah. she... <laughs> did she have a higher did she have a higher education? Did she pursue any type of degree? Did she have a job? Before I mean, even if she didn't have born? like a higher degree, did she have a job, you know? Or yeah. or a career path? And did she give this up when Dudley was born? Like I didn't even think of asking these questions until we were oh. like, let's gender bend the Dursleys. Oh my god. Now I just like I'm having like a revelation. <laughs> I can't believe I never thought about that. Either. <laughs> how how has no one ever asked that question that's so crazy yeah so i had a mini meltdown of like oh my god the patriarchy's working within me <laughs> honestly like that is a prime example right there uh, i'm glad we had this revelation together <laughs> yeah oh my gosh Man, now I feel now I kind of feel bad for like I I never really felt bad for Petunia. I mean, there's sometimes where I felt bad for Petunia because you know she lets Vernon walk all over her. But um, it's it's hard to feel bad for someone who's so horrible throughout the series. But you know, when you think about it that way, like no one seems to think about what she wanted to do with her life. Or I mean, maybe she maybe her life's goal was to just have a child and dote on it 
completely and spend her entire life devoted to this child because there are women who who you know that is their valid life choice and i and i support them um if if having a kid is their um you know the one thing that they wanted to do with their life like you go you do it you do you i'm so proud of you um and maybe that's what petunia wanted but you know, it might not always have been, and no one has ever thought about that. So I'm about to do a deep cut here, because I know you've listened to some of the um, later episodes, and a lot of people have just kind of come in at season four and just, you know, kind of blown past uh, seasons one, two, and three. But the second uh, the second or third ever episode uh, of Occupolitics is the politics of child rearing. And in there... I had a petunia revelation of where I felt not bad for her, but almost kind of curious about her decision to have a child because I myself have been very vocally conflicted about having children. Um, and and that doesn't mean I, I'm totally opposed to the idea, but mostly that I know how much labor is invested in having children and in my like head canon what happened to petunia was that she always wanted children and then she had dudley and she realized that even though she always wanted to have like a big family one was hard enough and that was it for her she was like struggling with postpartum depression or something like that and you know something that she didn't get treatment for and then she gets Harry, which is like this one child she never asked for and not and did not want, and it reminded her of like a sister that she you know had fallen out with, and like so so like it represented a mix of things that she did not respond to well. And I'm not saying that that's you know completely acceptable that she mistreated Harry in any way, but it made me feel some kind of empathy for her. Um, in a way where I was like, oh man, like this is also kind of the patriarchy at, at work because Vernon could have also helped. You know, as you were saying that, I kind of had some, some, some revelations of my own. Um, but no, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. And, um, I'm a hundred percent with you on like, i uh, not wanting children. I've been very vocal about not wanting children. So I can see like that through her eyes and I can definitely empathize with her on that. But I was kind of thinking, what if, like, I would love to learn more about Petunia and Vernon's backstory in regards to this, but, um, you know, what if they had troubles conceiving? What if they were, what if they thought they could never have a kid? And Dudley was like the miracle that yeah. they didn't think that they were going to have. And mm -hmm. that's why they don't on him and love him so much. Um, and then Harry comes in and Petunia's resentful because it's not, their child you know they they didn't get to have a second child because they couldn't yeah um and not only is it not her and vernon's child but he's you know he's lily's child and you know lily is you know this this larger than life character to to petunia who had gotten all these things that she wanted but couldn't have um and she's even more resentful of the fact that you know lily got to have this kid um, and she didn't get to have one other than Dudley. Yeah, and we also I could that too. yeah we also don't know how their parents died. Like, did they die at the hands of Voldemort's followers, and she's resentful because of that, or they did they they die of natural causes? Maybe Pottermore has something like that, but I usually stay away from like non book canon. <laughs> There's some pretty interesting stuff on Pottermore, and but I I would I would definitely I should look into that because I feel like that would that would be such a good backstory to have. Because um, like I could see if like their parents were murdered by like wizards, how Petunia's like, also you put my parents in jeopardy, and they died, and now you died, and this is the only and then, thing, you know, and now yeah, and that could be <laughs> that could be another reason why you know she hates magic so much and that's why and and therefore you know vernon also hates magic because of of her hatred because her parents died at the hands of it too i could see that for sure well i can and also, then harry yeah being harry is magical and therefore you know she hates magic harry is magical there you go <laughs> yeah I, I think also like that idea of they hate anything non-conventional is also a good mm -hmm. explanation for it but it's also for me such a surface level explanation 
that I, I almost want to see if there's anything else under there. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Man, this was that. This is such an interesting discussion. <laughs> this is so intense. I was like, maybe we won't have enough material for like enough time, but I feel like we've gone over what I thought we would. I, I thought maybe like twenty minutes. We've been here an hour. <laughs> Honestly, it's been it's been really, really uh, eye opening, at least for me. And I hope I hope everybody who's listening can agree. Oh, I feel like I've questioned uh, my own assumptions about how I view gender roles, even though I'm the first one that would die on the hill of like gender roles are a construction of the patriarchy to keep us in our place. But then I'm like, oh, wait, I subscribe to some of this implicitly and I need to question my own assumptions yeah and that question you asked me at the beginning of have you ever had a moment where you're like wow I just fell you know prey to the patriarchy um I definitely had that moment when I realized I had not thought about what Petunia would have done if she didn't have a kid (laughs) like it happened on the podcast (laughs) yeah you guys saw it here first (laughs) or I guess you heard it here first. Yeah, you it's, heard it first. It's a podcast. <laughs> podcast exclusive. <laughs> we had a small meltdown about the patriarchy. <laughs> oh my gosh. So oh. insane. This is Helene's first podcast ever, you guys. And she's doing so well. Oh, thank you. Yes, I was so nervous. I'd never recorded an episode before of any And podcast, I need to stop so. saying you guys. But also, it's a tick <laughs> and I can't get rid of it. Oh yeah, patriarchy right there, this guys. Is the patriarchy nope. at work. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to point it out every chance we get. Um, we should do like a thing where we we count how many times we mention the patriarchy in every episode. <laughs> uh, it's just like, take a shot every time of water. Stay hydrated. Yes. Live your best life. Live your best life. Okay. I think it's ready. We're ready to close this discussion. What do you feel? <laughs> I think that we have discussed the crap out of this. Okay. So in the main podcast, we usually end asking about like the media we've been consuming, but I thought we should take this one step further for these like Patreon exclusives and talk about media that you're enjoying today that is particularly progressive and feels good to have out in the world. Yeah. Um when I thought about this, there were just just a couple of things that came to mind. Uh, a lot, I have to admit, a lot of the media that I consume is like me rewatching things that I love. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So I, I mean, I do watch you know new things, but um, majority of it is is um, you know made in like the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> and um one of my answers to this will be very uh, uh it, it, you'll you'll see um but uh the first one that i thought of was queer eye um the reboot of um queer eye for what, the what guy yeah it's queer eye for, i was like what is the original one called i can't remember so yes uh queer eye the, re- the reboot of that show on netflix i think they're on they've done what is it two or three seasons i think Actually, it's three season four is coming out in july yes <laughs> yes, it's been so. Yes, I was gonna say that. Yeah, because I, I couldn't remember if it was uh, season four or season three. Um, yes, July like fourteenth or something. I'm so excited. But um, if you guys have not, oh, I said you guys. Goodness, if you have not, um, <laughs> if you have not seen Queer Eye on Netflix, honestly, like it is so much more than a home renovation like makeover show. So oh, much yeah. more than that. You will, there are episodes that will have you in tears. It is about a full life transformation. It's about being your best self, loving yourself. The main message is is loving yourself no matter what and being the best self that you can be. And these five guys, the Fab Five, they are just so loving and embracing and they are accepting and they are um, like that show just makes me feel so good about humanity when I watch it because there are some things in the world today that make me lose faith in humanity and that show kind of balances it all out and makes me regain some faith in humanity so I cannot talk about it enough 
You know, <clears throat> I feel the same way about Queer Eye, but I have follow-up questions. Oh, go ahead. Favorite Fab Five. Oh, gosh. Um, for a long time, it was Jonathan, and I I do love Jonathan, but I have a special place in my heart for Anthony. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He's just, well, first of all, he's beautiful. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, they're all very beautiful, but like Anthony is my, like my type of beautiful. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, I just, a guy who can cook. Oh, yes. I mean, this is also part of the patriarchy right there. You know, like a guy who can cook is attractive to me because it's not normal for men to do the cooking. Right. As okay. Patriarchy, I'd, like to, again. I'd like to uh, stop you right <laughs> there and tell you that one of the, re- one, of, one of the many reasons I married my husband is because he's a great cook. So I don't have to. Right. Yes. Cause I'm not, I cannot cook at all. So I need to find me a husband like Anthony. I can bake. I cannot cook. So uh, when he, you know, started cooking things for me and like making marinara sauce out of, you know, from scratch, I was like, yes, I will marry you. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I mean, I love Tan is also amazing. And so is Bobby and Cromo. I just love them all. I love them. Oh, goodness. They're so great. Okay. So that's your favorite. But who? Okay. So there's a difference between being favorite and who do you like align with? Who do you think you're most like and why? Who do I think I'm most like? I think I am most like Karamo. Mm-hmm. I feel uh, that. He's a definitely Hufflepuff. Yeah, he he seems I, – I, I tend to be very, very empathetic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I'm very – like I, li- I like to um, help people, you know – like I just like to help people. It's just about the Hufflepuff in me. I like to help them. Um, if they're, if they're sad, I want to help them be happy. If they, if they like need, um, you know, some enlightenment on how amazing of a person they are, if they don't realize it, I want to help them realize it. So, um, Karamo is extremely empathetic and very, uh, very similar in that aspect. I love him. Okay. So for me, I, in my mind, I think I'm definitely Jonathan cause I'm like extra, right? Mm-hmm. And my husband point, him. <laughs> pointed out honey, you're more like Bobby. You do all the hard work and no one recognizes it. Oh, oh, Bobby. Yeah, he's so underrated. And I was like, you made me so sad right now because I thought, here I am thinking like, I'm a star, but really I'm the overlooked one. (laughs) Oh man, you're you're a good combination of both, I feel. All right. Well, I, that makes me feel better. <laughs> like I, but also, I have a big personality, guys. <laughs> yes. If Bobby had just a bit, little bit bigger of a personality, I could, I could see it a bit better. Yeah, but Bobby does such great things, though. Like I'm just in awe of him. He's so. They're all very talented. But Bob, but like the the home transformations are part of like one of my favorite parts of the show. Yeah, I just want him to come over and transform my home for me. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, if only. Yeah, my husband was like, you can nominate me. It's fine. It's fine. (laughs) I'll pretend like I'm a slob. It's fine. That's a great idea. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And also, did you see them in Taylor Swift's new music video? I did. I did. It was was beautiful. I saw Tan France first and I gasped and I was like, wait, are we getting the, the Fab Five here? When he drinks the tea right out of yes, the oh, it was beautiful. Yes. Well, while queer eye, um, I had I had a second um answer to to your question as well. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and um, this is kind of a cheap because it's not actually out yet, but um, the Veronica Mars revival show comes out July twenty sixth, season four on Hulu, and. I am here for it. I don't know. I don't know if you've seen any of the promotional materials for it, but they released like a poster um, of it the other day. And the tagline was um, still fighting crime like a girl. And I loved it. Like I was like, I am here for this because I am so ready. Like Veronica Mars was a very progressive show in the early 2000s. Yeah. As far as like strong female character, badass, like kicking butt super witty, super funny, but lovable and serious and, you know, taken seriously. Um, And 
I am all for a strong female character. So that was like super, super important to me. Um, but I am so ready for Veronica Mars in the realm of 2019. We take the Me Too movement. We take Trump. We take all of these things that um, are so crappy in the world right now. And you insert Veronica Mars into that. Like she is not going to have any of it. You know, she is going to kick those walls down. She's going to kick ass and she's going to be a female icon in the in 2019 and I'm so ready for it oh yeah did you watch the movie did you enjoy that I did watch the movie I I did enjoy it I did feel like it was kind of more fan service it uh-huh. was um well, it, it was, it was um, on funded yeah <laughs> yes it was fun it was funded by the fans me being one of them I believe I pledged I don't remember how much I pledged but um so I understand it being fan service but um I I'm really excited for the more like long form episodes um, giving us a bit more story. It looks like the content that's going to be discussed in this se- in this season um, is going to be a lot more serious than what we had when she was, you know, in high school. Um, and it's going to be a lot more adult content. And I'm just, I, I'm, I'm so ready for it. I can't, I, I, I literally can't wait. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, so I've been reading. Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuinston. Um, and it is a modern romance novel um, between the first son of the United States and the Prince of and one of the Prince of Wales. Whoa, that sounds awesome. It's amazing. I mean, People, it, it looks like the cover kind of looks like a YA cover, but it's definitely not YA. It is not suitable. I mean, I used to read books with sex scenes when I was a teenager. So maybe, yes, it is suitable for teens, but <laughs> it's pretty heavy <laughs> in the sex scene so department. Is it, is it technically a romance novel then? Rather it is, than it like is a romance fiction? novel, yes. Okay. Um, oh, I like that. It, it is super progressive because the president of the United States is a woman also oh i'm so ready for that man bring it on (laughs) you need to i I mean everyone needs to read this it's beautiful it starts with like the typical like rom-com trope of like we hate each other you know love it Mm -hmm. um it's just a love story and it just so happens to be between two dudes and i love it yeah no i'm i'm putting that you and it's Oh, I wonder if they have it on Audible. I'm going to put it on my list. It is, it is on Audible because when I say I've been reading, I've been listening. <laughs> okay, yeah. I've kind, I've kind of transitioned from reading to listening. When you become a busy adult, you know, you got to multitask, right? And that's <laughs> Drive exactly into work. how I got into audiobooks because I used to be like really into saying like, uh, if you can read, why would you listen to a book? That's cheating. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> in my high horse. And then, like, I rolled down that horse into adulthood and was, like, face down on the pavement going, maybe I need to get some audiobooks. (laughs) Why waste your time in the car listening to music when you could be enlightened by a beautiful audiobook? And it's narrated beautifully. Ooh, who's it? Do you know who it's narrated by? Is it anybody we know? Uh, I don't think, I, I was not familiar with the narrator. Hold on. Uh, Ramon de Ocampo. Oh, he, that sound, you just said that so beautifully. Uh, I like, I could listen to you say that name. <laughs> You're welcome. Being bilingual <laughs> has its its perks. Uh, oh. um, also, another thing is that the first son is half Mexican, half white. Oh, that's amazing. That's so progressive. Like, so good. I, I was just, you know, I tweeted at the, the author the other day. I was like, when are we getting a movie out of this audiobook, uh, out of this book? Because it's so amazing. And then later, I felt like a fool because I found out that Amazon had actually bought the rights already. Oh, that's so great. Oh, I'm totally, uh, I'm, I'm so down for this. And I and I would love to think of, of of a book in that context, but with a lesbian couple. Like, how would that be? Different? Actually, oh, her I... next book is going to be a lesbian couple. Ugh, yes. We need better and more representation of lesbian couples in the media. Yeah, and, you know, like, this love story between, like, two dudes and, like, I, I don't want to give too much away, um, but it, it's just, it was, it swept me away. Um, I was... It not, I mean, 
I don't want to be canceled by saying this, but I'm going to be vulnerable. I was like, do you, uh, will I get the same kind of like emotions than if I was reading like a woman and a man falling in love, right? And then I was like, how silly was I? This is beautiful. This is like, I get the same emotions. <laughs> like, duh. One of my favorite um, podcasters, and she's a, actually a screenwriter, um, talks about, her name is Duana, and she's on the uh, Show Your Work podcast. And she talks about how the specific is universal. And this is this book is a very good example of specific. the specific is universal. It's not trying to pander to everyone. It's a very specific book with very specific quirks, with a very specific set of characters with lived experiences. And that makes it universal rather than trying to have universal characters. Oh, that's genius. I think, yeah, I think that's amazing. So... It's it's a it's a book that I feel so good to have out there in the world. <laughs> you know, I was like, yes, we need more of this. Where can I find more? <laughs> Man, now I'm thinking of like other things that I could I could I can say. Oh. So, I mean, you have we'll have more episodes to discuss the that, other things. <laughs> that is that is true. I'm like, oh man, I just thought of another show that I'm watching right now that like is a perfect example. I will stay tuned. Listen to the next episode if you are curious as to what show I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Become a patron at <laughs> patreon.com slash Politics <laughs> For exclusive content to find out what show Helene is thinking of. <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, I said guys again, Helene. <laughs> oh, I'm going to leave it in. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, muggles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and wizards alike, um, non match people. Um, I don't know how to say this anymore. Hello, listeners. I'm going to leave all of this in, and it's going to be great. <laughs> um, next episode, episode two of The Girl Who Lived, we will be discussing one, Rubius Hagrid as a woman. Dun, dun, dun. Name to be revealed in the next episode. Yeah, that sounds better than we haven't decided yet. (laughs) (laughs) It was supposed to be the secret. (laughs) So if you really enjoyed this episode, um, this is going to be a Patreon-only episode series. So become a patron at patreon.com slash Occupolitics for as little as $2 a month. So for $2 a month, you get a shout out on the podcast, uh, access to these episodes, access to videos that I make. Last time I made a video with my mom, who was kind enough to join me for a cameo, even though she doesn't listen to the podcast. Um, <laughs> you know, she was game. She's fine. Uh, And we talked about not political stuff as I usually do in these videos, but we found all my Polly Pockets and also Harry Potter toys that I still have in boxes. Oh my God. I used to have a ridiculous Polly Pockets collection. Well, do you know that they were selling for in eBay for like hundreds of dollars last year? Why did I get rid of my Polly Pockets collection? <laughs> I mean, I still have it, but I don't think they're selling quite as high right now. <laughs> I think that I think oh. it's faded, you know? Um, hold out. Hold out for it. It'll come back. Yeah. So um, we, we, I mean, I, we, ha- we had a show and tell of like all the toys that I found in my old room. It was great. And uh, so, so that's for, you know, the $2 a month and you're a wizard. And then for $5 a month, you get that plus a monthly sticker and the Owl Post rank tier. And then for $10, you get all that plus a recipe card. Beautiful. Monthly. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want that? That sounds delightful yes uh uh, in june uh i donated all the patreon pledges to the rape crisis center because it was my birthday and the sticker was a consensual uh uh, enthusiastic consent sticker in the bottle of like the love potion it was kind of cute if i do say so myself 
and I had a recipe to make gilly water because it's summer and it's hot. That sounds perfect. And anybody who's not a patron is super missing out. Um, yeah, I think so. All right. I think we're, we're done with this. What should our sign off be, Helene? I hope you enjoyed smashing the patriarchy with us today on The Girl Who Lived. Come back next time for some more revelation. Smash the patriarchy. I love it. Support this podcast for as little as $2 a month on patreon.com slash occupolitics. Follow the pod on social at occupolitics on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Email me at info at archaeopolitics.com with your thoughts, theories, and favorite moments of the series. You can also leave me a voicemail to be featured on the podcast at 915-996-1699. Theme music is Think Big by Scott Holmes. This podcast is brought to you by MuggleNet.com. Uh, I just woke up from a nap, so I might be <laughs> a little slow. Oh, goodness. I love naps. So much. Oh, me too. I, it was supposed to be a one hour nap that turned out to be an hour and 40 minute nap. Oh, that's nothing. I've had naps where like I've taken accidental like four or five hour naps before. Oh, no, no. If, if you know, like, <laughs> and this was kind of more like I made timers, you know, like one hour. Okay, 15 more minutes. Oh, 15 more minutes. And then I'm like, mm, 10 more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. I 100% feel that.